Hi, this is Jim Janissy. We're now on Chapter 25 of The Story of Art by Ernst Gombrich. This is the last chapter we'll cover in GPH 205. This chapter takes us up through a time that Gombrich characterizes as permanent revolution. What this means is that the old established ideas of art that were inherited from prior to around 1800 are pretty much overthrown in this century and we're going to see how that develops from the beginning of the century onward once again I've identified these themes in this chapter so that we can talk about this development of subject matter organized in this way and I'll repeat these words at the top of various slides as we move through these eight items first of all architectural style choices in chapter 24 we looked at the fact that in the early 1800s and even slightly before, people who commissioned buildings, that is, their own residences, had come to the conclusion that they could pretty well adopt any prior style that they wanted to for their residence, simply to express their own inclinations or something about their own preferences. Well, here we have a situation where the British Houses of Parliament had to have a new building erected. The older building that had housed them in the past burned down, and they chose to have the architects come up with a gothic type of a structure not to mimic something that it didn't really represent but to better commemorate the fact that the beginnings of parliamentary government and representation of the people in government actually began in the gothic era in England in 1215 with the signing of the Magna Carta where the king, though he ruled by divine right, recognized certain rights that his citizens had. So the building was constructed in sort of a mock Gothic style. And you can recognize various elements of that style here. More importantly, the challenge that arose to academic art, we can best understand by, first of all, seeing some examples of academic art as it was perceived at the beginning of the 1800s. Here we have two pictures, Nicolas Poussin and this et in Arcadia ego, which basically means here I am and you will be, or even here in this paradise am I, referring to death. The nature of this painting is such that although it's an outdoor scene, it actually looks like it has studio lighting. It almost looks like the background is a backdrop and this is lit in the studio. There's really no harsh shadows here. There are some shadows around where this shepherd is pointing here. But notice the very gradual chiaroscuro and the painting of the bodies in beautiful ways and the idealized nature of the subject matter here. We don't know why this woman is dressed as she is, sort of like a Greek goddess. We have some nicely posed shepherds here and they're looking at this tombstone. It's a bit of a melancholy scene. It makes you think. It's nicely centered and it's got this shape to it that was popular that it's sort of bigger in the middle and then slopes down towards the sides and things are very nice they're very beautified well by the 1800s the academy was well entrenched as the arbiter of taste in art and Jean Angre was one of the most famous painters of the day and he very definitely followed the academic style he painted the Valpissant bather in a very academic style you can tell from this that here too the lighting is very controlled. It's no harsh shadows. It's as if it's posed in a studio where the lighting could be controlled. And we have here very, very fine brushwork. In fact, the detail is really astounding when you look down here and you see how much detail is here. Very fine brushstrokes. But everywhere on the woman's body, we have things very nicely posed and very fine brush strokes so that the brush strokes aren't even visible. If you saw the piece of art in person you would see that, that you can't tell where the brush had laid down a stroke. It's very finely done. Now the subject is nicely centered. All things considered this met a lot of the requirements of the Academy for being considered fine art. What we're going to see in the 1800s is three challenges to this, the first two of which arose in combination with political turmoil and upset in France in 1830 and 1848. 1848 especially, there were a number of attempted revolutions in Europe. Perhaps it was a coincidence, perhaps rebellion was on people's minds. 
We're going to take a look at each one of these rebellions in turn. The last of these rebellions actually succeeded, and it did change the face of art. And there's a related development we'll talk about also at that point. But let's talk about 1830 now. Delacroix and Corot, both of whom felt color was more important than draftsmanship, and even more importantly that the subject matter didn't need to be restricted to the narrow range of things that the Academy considered acceptable for art. It didn't need to be classical in the sense of referring back to uh, Roman or Greek mythology or gods or religious themes or moralistic and uplifting themes. So here's an example of Delacroix's art. He was challenging academic art with this in the fact that the subject matter was nothing that academic art considered the subject matter of high art. Also, the colors are very intense, and the combination of colors violate some of the concepts of how colors should be combined, at least as far as the academy was concerned. It was very exciting. Kind of a practice charge here of some Arab cavalry. I think Delacroix had gone to Morocco or Algeria and had seen this scene and then decided to paint it. Now, where did he paint it? Well, he probably made some sketches in the field, and he probably came back to his studio and painted it. But the impact of the scene occurring outside, probably in harsh sunlight, has some effect on the way that he shaded these things, and some effect on the lighting. The chiaroscuro here is cruder than it would otherwise have been in a studio. And here's another piece of art, Algerian Women by Delacroix. And once again, the subject matter doesn't fit the definition of what the Academy said was considered acceptable for high art. And in fact, the way the colors are combined doesn't meet some of the Academy's requirements. And if we were to look closely at the original, we'd probably see that the brush strokes are fairly evident that the Academy would consider that he was sloppy in his work. Delacroix obviously felt that what he did was suited to the subject matter and his intent. Now, Corot violated a number of concepts of the Academy in forming this. First of all, the subject matter, there's nothing very profound about a boy sitting awkwardly on the stone wall. Painting a scene towards the evening, he's combined an awful lot of greens and browns here in a way that, well, that actually didn't make use of colors in the way that we would have blue in the background and brown in the foreground, although we do see some of that here. We also see some very fine use of atmospheric perspective, giving us a real sense that that mountain in the background is far distant. In the valley in between, the light is turning bluer and bluer as the distance increases between the viewer and that part of the scene. So this was not accepted either as academic art. And don't forget, at this point, the Academy controlled the exhibition of art. Without exhibiting it with the Academy stamp of approval, the wealthy buyers who would purchase the art weren't really very interested. So if it didn't pass the Academy's muster and meet their standards, probably the artist was doing this just simply because he had something to say and not because he was expecting to have much of a market for it. So the artist was sacrificing in this way for his principles.